Great. Well, good afternoon. Actually, I should say evening, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here, and we fully recognize that we stand between you and your evening plans, so certainly hope and look forward to a dynamic discussion. We know many in the audience, so just let us, we, we won't be shy. We may call on you, so certainly welcome your input along the way. But what better way to end such an exciting first day of the conference by talking about emerging technologies in Africa? I think we would all agree that it's a vast subject, but there's endless possibility, whether it's AI, robotics, uh, apps, Internet of Things, the possibilities and advancement in Africa are endless. Um, however, of course, there are challenges, accessibility, affordability, financing, the regulatory enabling environment, cybersecurity, so many considerations that we hope to jump into today. Um, by way of introduction, I'm Heather Lanigan. I am the Regional Director for Sub-Saharan Africa at the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, and very pleased to be joined by distinguished group panelists today. Uh, Selena Lee, the CEO and co-founder of Zindi Africa. Fatim Sisse, CEO of IHS Cote d'Ivoire, as well as the founder of Dukes. Dukes. And Etab Ekpe, founder and CEO of AutoCheck. So, to keep this lively and kick us off, I, you have such long and distinguished bios. I thought we could start off with a brief introduction of your company and why you want to be part of this conversation. Selena, would you like to start us off? Sure. Thank you so much. It's um, an honor to be here. Uh, let me start with a question. Um, how many of you out there work for companies or invest in companies that generate data, that create data in some way? There's not enough hands up. <laughs> um, of you who have your hands up, how many think that you're actually making the most of that data asset that you have? So this is, this is the problem that we're trying to solve at Zindi. We recognize that with digitization, companies are in this situation where they have more data than they ever knew they had before. And we also recognize that there are so many young people across Africa who are ready and prepared to help you make the most of your data. So we created Zindi. We're the largest professional network of data scientists in Africa. We have over 50,000 data scientists registered on our platform, solving real-world problems for companies like yours. Um, and I'm excited to be a part of this conversation because I see so much promise in the young people across the continent to help solve some of the most pressing business and social challenges there are. Thank you. It's up. Um, thank you very much. Um, at AutoCheck Africa, um, we basically focus on a core problem, which is access to vehicle finance. So if you look at sort of standard um, emerging market economies, so countries like Indonesia, for instance, Mexico, they usually have an average of about 60 to 70% credit pen institutional credit penetration in automotive transactions. And when you look at the average GDP per capita on the continent at about 2,500, the average car price is about 5,000 you know, fundamentally, mobility is linked to what we call transportation poverty. And so regardless of what levels of development you have, without effective mobility, people can access opportunities for better lives, better jobs. So we typically focus on enhancing um, credit access by working with banking institutions and existing players in the industries, i.e. car dealerships, things like that. We have um, what we call a data management system so this basically enhances the digital application process. We crunch all this data, send this to the banking institutions in a way that helps them de-risk their investment. So fundamentally enhancing credit access and driving up um, access to vehicle finance across the continent. And we're operational in about now eight countries um, across the continent. And why does this conversation matter to you? Why? Personally or professionally, yes. Why is it what? Why, why do you want to be part of this conversation today? Because um, I, I, I really like the idea of, uh, you know, digital in existing um, ecosystems. The automotive eco ecosystem is probably one of the oldest on the continent. Um, and I like the idea around how you bring in technology to solve a problem um, and, and enhance fundamentally, you know, things that in, in enhance productivity within an industry. So our view is that at less than 2% credit penetration, right, if you look at other emerging economies in excess of 65, 70%, and we kind of move that wave. Currently, the industry is about $50 billion with less than 2% credit penetration. As you, we go to 25%, right? Credit penetration over the next 10 years. I mean, you're talking about an industri industry that could easily exceed $300 billion. Yeah. Thank you. Patin? Thank you. So thank you for having me. 
Um, I will start by the second question. Why this conversation is important to me? It's because I have two responsibilities that matter to me. First, I'm the CEO of IHS Towers in Côte d'Ivoire, which is uh, the biggest and only tower co here. What we do is we manage the infrastructure for telecommunications operators. So we are responsible for energy, security of their assets, and also for deployment also. So it's important to us to understand the market, where it's going, in order to be able to make the deployments and make sure that we have the availability where needed. And also, I'm a founder of Dux Côte d'Ivoire, which is uh, responsible for AI applications um, for companies here in Côte d'Ivoire and also for training for the youth. So any opportunity that I get to interact with specialists of the sector, understand where we are going and what should be uh, our next move is important to me also personally. So that's why I wanted to be here. Thank you. Great. And thank you so much for sharing your perspectives. I, uh, I guess that's my responsibility is to share the same. Um, so the U.S. Trade Development Agency, or U.S. TDA, uh, works alongside the U.S. private sector to support the development of infrastructure projects in emerging markets. We specifically work pre-financing in the project preparation stage where to structure bankable infrastructure deals that can attract financing, be implemented, and of course sustained. Digital infrastructure is incredibly important to our agency. It is a cornerstone, I would say, and the foundation of most of our activities. We work across multiple sectors, but really digital inclusion, accessibility, connectivity has been incredibly important for us, and we have very strong partners and projects in the continent. Um, I should also say, of course, being part of the U.S. government, I, I know many of my colleagues are here today, we are very committed across the U.S. government to supporting Africa's digital ecosystem and the growth of it. Uh, we are ready to commit our, and continue to commit our full resources and toolkit to support our partners and projects in the public and private sector. That's why it's important for me to be here today. But we're here to hear from the experts. And so have a lot of, I think, great questions um, that really want to hear from you. But also certainly, again, for the audience, we see you and really want to hear from you throughout the conversation. Feel free to raise your hand. We'll also make sure to reserve time for Q&A at the end. But again, as noted, there's a lot of topics we could discuss today. I certainly want to talk about the opportunities and the challenges. I want to touch on financing and the regulatory environment and also understand how the governments and private sector can work together. But let's start this off fairly big picture. Um, and you can all choose to take this in any direction you'd like. But what are you seeing as the largest opportunities in emerging tech across the continent? This could be geographies, this could be specific sectors, but let's start off with that and welcome any of you to jump in. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I, th I think building on, on what, what is exciting, I think what's interesting in Africa is that with digitization, we saw this tremendous leapfrogging where you went from totally analog to totally digital. And then, you know, the amount of data that exists today, 90% of it was generated in the last two years. It's just exponential and it's exploding. And this can be either a threat or an opportunity if we don't really, are, if we're not able to harness the power of all of this data that we're generating, um, you know, we're, we've missed a huge opportunity for growth, you know, for human growth, for human capital growth, for economic growth. Um, so I think that AI, data science, machine learning is the next frontier, and that's what we're seeing as a huge trend um, on the continent right now. It's exploding. Um, I would typically mirror where I would call the biggest problem areas represent the largest opportunity. So areas like um, mobility and transportation, obviously, healthcare, um, education as well, I think are, are um, and then I think um, food production as well. Yeah, we are in a continent that is growing uh, demographically very fast. And we've been very, um, I would say not as fast in adopting and scaling up technologies. So uh, in terms of opportunity, I think every sector could benefit from uh, the use of new technologies and all the opportunities that they bring to, to the table. Uh, we have in Côte d'Ivoire what we call the PND, is the Program for National Development. And when you look at the priorities of the government, most of those can be tackled through the 
better use of digitization and all those new applications uh, thanks to AI and new, uh, new systems. So I think for us, every sector that is priority to us but could benefit from the, the, all those new technologies. So it's about giving direction and also uh, making sure that the whole ecosystem is uh, tailored in a way that we can foster really all those new in initiatives uh, and allow us to, to achieve those objectives for the, the government. So I would not single out uh, specific, um, specific areas, but of course we know that we have challenges around agriculture, education, health, and uh, I'm sure that uh, all the, those sectors can benefit from really uh, better use of uh, those new technologies. Sina, could we dig a little bit more into AI? Um, certainly know incredible expertise in this space, but how do you see AI playing a role in traditional sectors? Any examples? Not to put you on the spot, but I'm sure you have many. Yeah, I think, so AI is funny because it's, I mean, it's beyond a buzzword at this point, right? So AI, a lot of times what comes to mind are the robots. Um, and I want to say that let's take it back down to earth. That AI is much more than that. I mean, it's almost like by taking it down, we're saying it's actually much more. Um, uh, so I think that the exciting applications within AI that we've worked on as Zindi. So on Zindi, we host challenges where the industry can put up their data sets or their problems. And then we have a community of over 50,000 data scientists that then compete to build the best solutions for them. So we've, we've run over 150 challenges on the platform. We've seen all kinds of things. I think what's exciting to me about AI and data science is that uh, you get to play in everyone's backyard. So all of these sectors, education, transport, logistics, even marketing, financial services, all of these sectors have a need um, for better, better use of their data through data science and machine learning. Um, so to just give a few examples, uh, maybe starting from some of the work that we've done with the government in South Africa, uh, AI is used by the space agency to automate the process of identifying where informal settlements are coming up in real time because, the, because they're able to, instead of going physically to travel across the entire country, they're actually able to use their satellite imagery. Um, we also worked with the Roads Authority to predict down to a 500 meter radius where the next accident would happen every hour for the next week. So that helps their first responders be able to position their, um, the ambulances or the first responders more efficiently, which can um, you know, save hundreds of lives. Uh, so those are just a few examples. Incredible. Uh, if I may, I think uh, she, she said the word uh, predictability. Uh, in Africa, very often we manage things that we cannot predict. So we are more in a reactive mode. But by a proper use of AI and anticipation, we're able to allocate those few resources that we have more wisely and we're able to make more um, impact, impactful programs and, and re react, uh, solutions to the problems that we are anticipating. Instead of waiting for things to happen and then react, we're able to predict better with the use of AI. So I think that's really uh, could benefit every sector. And also uh, with the lack of resources that we have, we cannot afford to uh, waste <laughs> any of them. So AI is really key for us and we feel that it's the solution for us for African countries in order to allocate those resources wisely in the future. Absolutely. I could imagine though by bringing AI and other disruptive, as we say with technologies, there's also some challenges. Um, Etab, we were talking a little bit before about the ecosystem and how some th observations or challenges in bringing a new technology to, and how it to be, it's careful not to disenfranchise existing partners, players, and entities. Would you talk a little bit from your perspective uh, on that challenge or okay, balance? So, um, so an example, basically, if I look at the automotive industry, and so it's sort of broken down into sort of the, what I would call OEM-driven, more formalized, recognizable industry. But 85% 85, 85 of transactions pretty much happen in the informal sector. And within that informal sector, you have the traders, who trade day to day. And then you have uh, typically a very important part of um, automotive, which is after sales. So that's post 
maintenance, and this is pretty much what feeds millions of millions of people across the economies that happen, and these are extremely informal. Now, <clears throat> you'd find that um, there's a lot, of a lot of legislation around improving sort of quality of vehicles that are being sold, um, how do you drive an EV initiative, you know, things like that, very high level discussed, top level in governments and, and, and you know, development agencies, but no one is typically linking who is actually driving the sector today and where fundamentally value is being created. That's where the value is being created. So two issues that come up from a government perspective, one is how do you actually drive policy down to the ground? Two is how do you provide an uh, input whereby you can get more capital into that segment and at the same time also be able to generate revenue through um, accurate taxation, right? And, and so if you look at the automotive sector, it's very heavy in terms of contribution to most global economies, right? So if you look at like a lot of the comp a lot of top companies across most global economies are driven by the automotive sector. So I think the way we had looked at how we wanted to um, fundamentally drive change within the ecosystem itself was recognizing that, you know, this sector actually has existing players, right? And what are the fundamental challenges that is preventing capital from going in here? And having looked closely, spoken to the banks, we found that the main challenges they had, um, aside of course credit assessment, were fundamentally around valuation of the vehicles, right? And without valuation, it's impossible to ascertain what you would call residual value, which is very important for any kind of credit institution. Um, the second aspect basically was being able to ask, uh, effectively assess the condition of the vehicle, right? And valuation fundamentally is, is, is determined by the sales side because the valuation itself is fundamentally driven by day-to-day -day trading. Now in more formal economies, this data is aggregated either through regular inputs for tax purpose reporting or through what you would call secondary, secondary liquidation systems, i.e. large auction houses, things like that. These systems don't exist here. So one problem to solve valuation. Second basically is condition analysis. Now condition analysis is basically looking at a car and saying what's the standardized condition of this vehicle and how do you create a system that once any kind of formal formalized inspection is done on the car, everyone typically can generate a score um, around what this asset really is, right? And this is what determines true roadworthiness. So solving those two problems meant that we went into the markets and began to work with the car dealerships because for, informally they know, how, they know what the car price of cars are, right? But how do you quantify this data in itself, right? So basically it meant them working with our systems with an incentive, of course, to be able to gain credit. There, was, there, there has to be an incentive for them. So you want to drive change? What's the, what, what's the importance of them? Fine. If we do X, Y, Z, these are the banks, you're going to be able to access credit. On the other end as well, when you're looking at valuation, uh, sorry, condition analysis, this is basically driven by the, a lot of the repair workshops that operate in the market as well. What's the incentive for them to ensure that as they repair vehicles, they, they update the reports and they work within a certain standard? Credit as well. So linking these two segments with the incentive to be able to generate data and in exchange for that data and their way of working, they can access credit, the, cre the data begins to flow and that creates a lot of transparency in the system. And that way, you're not, you, you can then begin to drive policy and get them included, inclusive. Because fundamentally, what we've seen is that the biggest limitations to these informal sectors are one, being able to be technically upskilled. They're hardworking, they want to grow, they just need technical upskilling. And the second thing is access to credit, right? To be able to grow their business is just like everyone needs. So I think it's very important that when you look at sort of ecosystems, um, especially within the continent, because they represent a large fabric of social support to a lot of families, it's very important that they are tied into general policy. So for me, I think when, whenever we look at strategies, ensuring that the existing players that are driving day-to-day -day transactions are infused into whatever strategies are being deployed to improve that sector. Thank you very much. We're going to come back to the access to credit for sure. I want to step back actually, Fatim, to talk about a bit infrastructure. And not only because it's my job, infrastructure, but also because it's incredibly foundational. Emerging tech is only possible if there's, for example, connectivity. I know that IHS is playing a very large role in that in Cote d'Ivoire and across the continent. Could you talk a little bit about what you're seeing as some of the challenges, whether it's next generation networks, fiber rollout, in terms of enabling the infrastructure for emerging tech? 
thank you. Yeah, for IHS is uh, very active in deploying infrastructure and also securing the existing infrastructure. Our commitment is to make uh, uh, connectivity available 99.9% .9 of the time. So that comes with a lot of challenges around energy because in Africa, even if Cote d'Ivoire is one of the good students, I would say in terms of uh, uh, grid availability, we still have some challenges around that, where we need to make sure that we're able to intervene in case of uh, grid outage, in case of uh, security issues uh, impacting the site. So we have 24-7 teams around the country that are managing the network and making sure that uh, the availability remains. So that's a challenge already, and it's going to be even bigger with the 5G coming, because we can see that the real challenge is not really around investment, it's more around power. Um, right now, uh, what we see uh, with the tests that are being made with the 5G is that the energy consumption will double, uh, if not triple in the coming years. Now, I'm talking about two to three years. So that's something that we need to tackle because uh, right now the, the investment that we're making into our sites needs to be upgraded in order, in, able, in order to be able to support those coming needs in terms of additional uh, connectivity. Uh, rural sites are also a big challenge because right now, um, I'll give a very simple example. If I, do, uh, if I make a site in a very remote area, I will spend the same amount, but I will spend even more with the maintenance, security, and making sure that uh, we, I have generators in place because the grid availability might not be as, as much as uh, the one in Abidjan. And I will be penalized the same in case of an availability for rural sites as I am for sites in the middle of Abidjan. So uh, there are a lot of challenges coming that we need to be uh, that needs to be addressed if we want to really uh, foster that investment in the in the coming years that will be needed for 5G and for rural sites inclusion. Uh, so um, yes, there are a lot of regulatory issues also, like I was mentioning about maybe uh, having different treatment for rural sites that we have for sites in urban areas. Uh, fostering mutualization because right now IHS is all about the business model is around mutualization when we build the site you can accommodate up to three operators on the same site it allows us to make some economies of, sale, of scale but right now with the regulation uh, there's nothing preventing a competitor to come and make a site uh, very close to our site we will really uh, hurt the business model so we need regulate, regulation around the development of the infrastructure in order to make sure that our investment uh, is, uh, remains pertinent even uh, when we, we, make, uh, we invest in areas where uh, the, the profitability is very, very low. So there are a lot of challenges, power, regulatory, and also even uh, talking to the populations. We have instances where we have access to sites being blocked. We have uh, uh, vandalism around the sites where people do not necessarily realize that those infrastructure are very uh, vital <laughs> for them in order to be able to access uh, the, the, those um, services that they, they use on a daily basis. So there are a lot of challenges. Uh, thankfully, uh, the government is looking at that and seeing uh, how we can improve that sector in the coming years and make sure that uh, we can be up to the challenge that is coming around 5G, around the fiber, etc. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. I know that IHS is doing absolutely fantastic work. I want to build on that a bit. As mentioned at the top, I think one of the greatest challenges is that with tech, there's so much possibility, but also at the potential expense of further exclusion. So if we could talk a little bit, maybe Etap and, and um, Selena, your perspective too about how do we build, you know, really think about accessibility, affordability as we continue to advance the digital ecosystem and emerging tech. Uh, maybe just some experience from your companies. How are you ensuring what you're investing in um, and supporting is as inclusive as possible? And obviously it, it, there's upfront costs, but thinking about the long term, how to make sure it's inclusive for all. Yeah, I think 
that's something that's really exciting. I, our, our mission at Zindi is to make AI accessible to everyone so that everyone has a pathway to become a data scientist, regardless of race, gender, geography. Um, and one of the exciting outcomes of this, I think, is that a lot of the AI innovation and solutions are coming out of places like Silicon Valley, where they can make your Siri or Alexa work better, but how do we translate that kind of innovation into an environment where maybe the resources are not the same, where the technology is not the same, where the environment is not the same? So how do we actually push ourselves to innovate even further to get the same impact in a more resource-constrained environment. So that's something that we're really interested in at Zindi. Uh, we, when we run challenges on Zindi, we take into consideration that people don't have access to the most powerful computers. How can we leverage you know, the internet and cloud to let people work off of even their cell phones to build a machine learning or AI solution on their cell phones? Um, so that's something that we struggle with, quite honestly. We have 50,000 data scientists on our platform, and you know, a lot of them are excluded just by pure accessibility of internet, um, unfortunately. It's, uh, it's something that we do think about a lot. I think the other angle is that we have 27% female participation on our platform, so that's another angle for us that we are very conscious of. Um, and we've run different programs for the women on our platform, like mentorship programs, connecting more senior data women data scientists to the more junior ones, and that's been really successful. I think the key to all of this is, well, is that we're building community. And we like to say that data science is a team sport. And you know, the power of community can get us quite far. Um, but we also, of course, need the supporting infrastructure and you know, to keep making strides in, in those areas. Any thoughts at um, I, I think uh, access capital is very critical for for um, you know technology businesses. Um, I think that you know fundamentally they need to be upfront investments, and that's where like a big a, a very good understanding of sort of funding ecosystems. So, for instance, if you look at a forum like this, right, um, which sort of is a pinnacle of African investment in terms of size, deal size, um, you have a lot of activity happening today at sort of very early stage pre-seed and, and you know, seed rounds in terms of um, sort of young technologies coming, coming through. But I think sort of like going through funding cycles, it's very critical that as businesses are scaling, they are being connected to ecosystems like the African Investment Forum, because I think this represents sort of the future deals that will, a lot of the companies that are being built today, um, you know, are seeking, you know, a lot of investment opportunities from either, you know, Silicon Valley, New York, uh, European-based funds as well. However, there are forums like this that are not sort of connecting these ecosystems and recognizing the opportunities that exist. So I think um, one basically is, I think, a lot of how we think through the process of identifying a lot of the, you know, sort of early stage opportunities that are not fundamentally recognizable in terms of what they're solving, um, how the profitability model looks, how the long-term scalability of this is, and sort of ensuring that education is happening at this level to identify these opportunities so we can actually drive deal flow to the future of the continent's growth. Speaking of the future, um, and picking up what Selena mentioned too, skills building. Uh, incredibly important, of course, I think from the whole ecosystem, from entrepreneurs to CEOs, really developing the skills ecosystem across the continent. Patin, would you like to start off with that? What are you seeing as the most important trends in, 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 in you know, commitments to skills building and really addressing the opportunity of the, of the youth and the population with what's coming next? Oh, we, we are very, I think it's critical. Uh, when you see the way, uh, the way technological advancement is impacting already our companies, we see uh, startups uh, from, <laughs> I would not cite, I would not give the names of any, but we see like a lot of startups coming to, to Abidjan. We can feel that unless we're able to tackle that uh, competency issue uh, very um, in extensively and uh, very aggressively, uh, we'll be in the same position as where we were in uh, during the prior industrial revolutions where we were exporting uh, very low value uh, items and importing all the, the high value items. 
Right now what we see is uh, whenever we, we train people, given the, 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 the lack of uh, competency all across the world, even when we train people, they, are, they tend to go and work abroad and we cannot really benefit locally from those people that are being trained. So that gap is get, getting bigger and bigger and then we see startups from other countries and uh, European countries come and uh, take all the, the, I would say, the available uh, market here in Cote d'Ivoire. So I think it should be looked at as a whole um, issue uh, and make sure that whoever we train can be engaged in very uh, high value, uh, high value projects here that would benefit our countries and also make sure that uh, the whole ecosystem is uh, catered in a way where we can keep and retain our competence here in, uh, in the continent. And I think that's going to be a big challenge because it's not only about training, it's about making sure that uh, the competency that we create can actually benefit us and that people can actually look at our own issues and work around issues that will benefit uh, the continent. And that is something that needs to be really uh, tackled if we want to, to improve the competency. So as a company at IHS, we involve in training and we also make sure that we create some good job opportunities and that we make sure that uh, the people that we recruit and hire uh, can have uh, similar opportunities that they would get abroad. Uh, this is something that is very, uh, I would say, dear to our heart to make sure that we really work around the whole uh, working um, environment for, for our, our staff to make sure that we retain the talent that we are creating. Etab Selina, anything to add to that? Yeah, I'm, uh, Africa has the fastest of working age population in the world, and it's the hugest opportunity, but youth employment remains incredibly high. Um, and that's, that's just a missed opportunity for everyone. Um, one of the top data scientists on Zindi, so we have a leaderboard of all of the 50,000 data scientists and how they've competed and won different challenges. And one of the top guys was a young man in Kenya uh, he had a degree in economics. He was working in uh, customer support at a bank. Um, and then he decided he wanted to be a data scientist. So he took some online courses. He even did a boot camp in Kenya. But even with that training, he wasn't able to get a job. So he started, and then he found Zindi. He started working on Zindi, started building real models for companies like ABSA or Microsoft. Um, but in truth, he struggled to get a job, but through the real world experience that he got on Zindi, he was actually able to get his first job as a data scientist at a major bank in Nairobi. Um, and he, he even started to mentor people on the platform. And I think that there's just tremendous opportunity in the young people. They're very, you know, the people on Zindi that I meet are incredibly driven. Most of them are self-trained data scientists and they are, you know, resourceful, finding solutions where other people in the whole world wouldn't have been able to find solutions. Um, so anyway, so I think the skills building is just an incredibly fundamental part. And, um, and we also, as, um, as Fatim said, we have to make sure that the skills that we're training people in is actually getting them job ready, that they can enter the market ready to have an impact. Okay, so Abid, I think the, um, what the most critical area right now that there should be focus on is basically around software development and data science. I think these are globally, massively globally demanded skills. And we are seeing um, a lot of young Africans pretty much being employed globally, earning um, compensation benchmark at, you know, sort of like, um, you know, first world salary basis, right? This has a huge impact on what they can do in their communities and environments, right? So I think on one end, right, there's that aspect which trains them, which basically puts them there. The second is there's also a massive demand for their skills even locally. And, and so I think a job opportunity that exists where we don't have to export um, sort of that demand and we actually have the skill set to handle this. You're seeing situations where Microsoft is setting up dev centers locally. Amazon is setting up dev centers locally. Google is setting up dev centers. So there's a recognition in talent. I don't think that if you look at the level of uh, unemployment, 
and what it actually takes to get these guys ready to go into, in, 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 into the shop in a sense. You know, I think there should be a lot of focus and there's just not enough focus there. Um, I think if you look at the transition of where India is today, a lot of focus was placed there and you can kind of see how that has transitioned to their dominance in Silicon Valley today and across more, a lot of, lot of other countries. I think that could be replicated here. I think the next level basically will be focusing on development, like I said, as number one. Number two is management because a lot of the companies that, um, technology companies will rapidly grow simply because of the explosion of the internet and the ability to deliver services. But what ten tends to happen is that um, a lot of these young entrepreneurs or young founders aren't prepared for the natural evolution of running larger companies. And I think the benefit of these technology companies is the ability to build in large scale institutions that for instance can hire 100,000 people, 200,000 people, right? That's how you solve the employment problem. But without equipping them with the management skill set to begin to move from where I'm in a basement, I'm in a garage, and you know, my software works, and then I'm scaling that out, it's consumed, and I'm still able to make that transition. And that, that's a real value in those companies, right? And so I think there's a big lack in terms of just managerial skill, right, that can be equipped with these people to really extract the opportunities available in this company. So from, for me, I think those are the two key areas that, you know, there should be a lot of focus on in terms of um, training. Absolutely. I, I just, speaking of Microsoft, I had the pleasure of visiting the Microsoft Africa Development Center in Lagos two weeks ago, and that was some of the engineers. It was just unbelievable what they're doing there, and then innovation, and things being built in Lagos that are, you know, servicing the entire world. Uh, there's lots of stories, so I'll, I'll hold off on those, but I was just, I left so impressed and inspired quite frankly. Um, but with, with inspiration, I want to get down to the money. Uh, we've all talked about the challenges of financing. First one, and understand who's in the room. Um, are there VCs in the room or financiers? If so, great. Just one? <laughs> I see two. Any other financiers? Okay, great. Well, we're going to maybe put you on the spot. I think I saw four. Um, let's actually start off with this day. I think a, a, a fairly direct question about your, your personal experiencing and, and experience with your companies. What are some of the key learnings on fundraising and financing that you would tell maybe your younger self about this sector? Um, what are some challenges or, or things that have surprised you along the way? I'll start. Um, so Zindi did a, we did our seed round last year and we're raising right now. Um, and I think one of the sad truths is that we really have had to turn to Silicon Valley for our funding. Um, I think that it's, it's a hard ecosystem. Africa is a hard ecosystem for, for tech startups in a lot of ways. I think that there's not a lot of tolerance for risk and there's not a lot of opportunities for early stage um, tech startups, especially ones that are a bit more out of the box or not as recognizable. Um, so it's, yeah, it, I mean, it, there's a lot of challenges, but I also see that there's a lot of, I mean, we do have a number of um, African VCs that we work with, like Founders Factory Africa, Launch Africa, um, and they've been really fantastic. Are you seeing a growth of African VCs? I think, yeah, I think I think so. It, I mean, I think over the last couple of years, it feels like there's been a lot more opportunities for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely a, a massive improvement in terms, especially at the early stage. And I think these are fundamentally driven, like um, from, for instance, Stripe's acquisition of Paystack. There are a couple of um, inc interesting exits that happened um, in, in South Africa as well. I think uh, sort of Flutterwave and Chipakashi's sort of valuation at a billion plus in terms of, I mean, I think these are things that are pretty much, and, 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 and it's, it's a business, it's fundamentally a business. Investment is a business. And I think the biggest problem with restriction of capital is fundamentally the lack of a clear exit path for most businesses. Um, that startup, right? It's not, I think there's a perception where it's, you know, about fun and, you know, just building technology products, but it's fundamentally a business, right? And I think for me, my younger self would be to say that, you know, you're competing with global, like an investor typically has, they usually would have an emerging market focus. So you're competing with businesses across Brazil, Mexico, blah, 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 all these countries. And the growth rates that are demanded are higher. So you're, you're, you're in a global game. 
Um, so I think the sector that you typically identify, the product that you identify, um, how much you have to realize that you know, it's a global playing field and you know, be very careful about what you want to get into just to ensure. Because I think that if, regardless of what happens, right, I think the big challenge, and, and that's where you see a lot of the change that has occurred, I think, in the last sort of four or five years, with a lot of focus on fintech and things like that, because as against going to the consumer sector, which is where a lot of tech investment or a lot of tech companies were focused on about five years ago, and right now what you see is back-end infrastructure addressing core problems like B2B, fintech, data gathering. They're not fancy. You know, they're not necessarily consumer, but they're solving core problems. And these are the billion-dollar opportunities that exist. This is what attracts the financing. So I think you know, segmentation is very key, and then how to scale as well. But I think there's, there's definitely a good access on early stage. I think where you start to see problems basically are how you know, business has gone through sort of very early stage uh, funding cycles. And then they now really need growth capital, right? Which is where I think um, a lot of restriction happens. Because when a business now needs to raise in excess of about 40 or $50 million, you know, sort of take them to that level where it's pre-IPO, you know, the, the analysis that goes into that kind of business, right? And, and, and the level of risk is, is heightened. So the key question is, who are those and how? And I think also a lot of participation with current private equity funds that are currently investing now, how are they doing? Like, you know, I was, I was on a panel recently, we were talking about LXI, and how do you typically make that visibility, make them much more comfortable to invest on a continent? But I think there's definitely been a lot of activity. Yeah. Uh, finding the right partner, <laughs> because sometimes we are startup are uh, very focused on developing the product and making sure that the product is accurate and that it works and that there is demand for it. But uh, being in a business like this and having to raise funds uh, takes a very specific skill set. And uh, to be a startup, uh, having someone who knows finance is not a luxury. So that's, uh, I think, the advice I would give to my younger self is to really seek uh, the advice uh, very early on, the development of the, the startup for people that are specially, specialized in finance and knowing where to find the funds that are necessary to deploy uh, the product, uh, perform the research and development, etc. So finding the right partner is important. That's great. Have any of you worked with um, DFIs, development finance institutions based in Africa? Um, I am in the process. Yeah. It's very long, very okay. tiring. <laughs> and I think it's very difficult for, you know, sort of a startup to, you have to invest the time if you're going to yeah. get accessible funding. Uh, it definitely takes a long sure. time. You know, I'm, I'm currently in a, an application yeah. process. It's been at least 12 months. Hopefully, we'll get through in the next 12 months as well. Um, but I think the main challenge basically is just the time and effort required, and what that does as a drain on, 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 on resources, you know, I think could be quite tedious. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Okay. Um, I know we're, I think we're getting short on time and certainly want to open up to some questions from the, from the audience, but also just want to close, this could be a very long discussion point, but just, a, I guess, a, a last topic is on the enabling environment. There's, I think, a, a delicate dance between regulation and governance with emerging technologies and then letting the market uh, do its great things. Um, I know there's been some passages of startup laws recently, one in Nigeria, I believe. Um, so just curious, are there any good examples, it could be Nigeria, it could be elsewhere, of where you think that some of the governments are, are getting it right or encouraging the private sector? So um, we're operational in eight countries. So I've had a very good look at, you know, various setups, how to set up uh, finance laws, credit laws, um, uh, you know, everything, legal, regulatory. And to be honest, you'd be surprised. I'm not ranking, but I think there's media publications, and then it's actually where it's easy to do business. Mm -hmm. And then I think um, starting up, setting up a business is, is but I think also good, strong legal systems where if there are issues, you can actually get legal recourse, right? Because this is also a critical part of what we do. So we've had a very good sense of, you know, all aspects of it. And I think the first challenge basically is just how diverse, you know, it's not a homogeneous uh, continent. And I think the, the, the estimation is, 
is that it's homogenous, right? It's not. It's very different from country to country, which makes it very, you know, also in terms of investment of resources. So when you look at expanding across jurisdictions, it's very expensive because you have to, um, you can't recycle, you know, sort of initial investments, maybe probably beyond Ohada. You can't find um, scenarios where, you know, you're able, you have to look at each country, typically independently, and do your research and invest in actually understanding what the laws say. Um, so I think that kind of makes it tough. Uh, I think various gov it's very interesting, but various governments, they, you know, they might not be, some might not be great at sort of like re regulation, but some might be great at legal recourse, some might be great at digitization, but then legal recourse. So I think in, in various ways you see improvements. I think there's a general um, advocacy around improving, so I wouldn't say it's terrible. Um, but my honest opinion, my honest opinion is that it, sh it could be fundamentally better across most, uh, beyond, and like I said, I'm not going to mention any names, but beyond one or two um, East African countries I, who I think have gotten it right in terms of sort of ease of doing business, I think everybody else typically has a lot of work to do. I will speak for my legal director in the, in the room here. I think I can speak for Cote d'Ivoire and they have uh, adopted that bottom-up approach where they speak to the actors of the sector and uh, there is an open dialogue with the, between the investors, the, the, the companies, the CEOs and the regulatory uh, instances. Uh, we are still waiting for actual results and actual decisions being made very uh, faster than it is, but at least there's a dialogue, an open dialogue where we can uh, talk about our issues and maybe impact the way they, they, they draft the regulations. So I think we are on the right path. Now we need to work on uh, the, the, the speed <laughs> of adoption of some of those uh, reforms. Leave that, Selena. With that, I, I know that we are short on time, but certainly would love to take some questions from the audience. So please uh, feel free to stand up. We'll get a mic to you if you have any questions. Oh, yeah. providing their insights and their expertise. But, you know, a lot of entities see data as a secondary sales line right now. Um, and partly because the um, eyeballs are just worth less in Africa right now because the marketing and advertising industries are very small. So you can't really monetize eyeballs and just sell data. So I'm curious, uh, particularly ETOP and... and Celine, your views on when we'll see businesses that are actually selling data as their core business? That's an interesting question. Um, I, I mean, I think it's already happening. That's what I'm, I am actually seeing. And um, yeah, I mean, on Zindi, it, aside from the competitions that we run, which I guess can be termed as gig work, it's also about building that pipeline of talent into the companies so that they can even hire these data scientists. And I think the first step is seeing if companies are able to make sense of their data, organize their data, because at the end of the day, in order to sell eyeballs, you actually have to know who those eyeballs belong to. And I think that's, you know, maybe one of the first challenges that a lot of companies are starting to already make sense of. Um, and so I think the key is just building up the data capacity within the companies so that they can optimize. Um, yeah. Um, so I have seen scenarios where I, th I think there's a there's definitely a demand for b businesses, especially traditional businesses, to get smarter in their decision making. Um, you can see sort of from the economic environments that are that you know that it's it's getting harder and harder to break a profit. You know, for a lot of these companies, so they need deeper insights to understand exactly where should they should be deploying their capital. Um, so I have seen insights. So I'll give you an example around FMCGs that are looking for solutions where they can bypass sort of 
because you know they have information of what's going to distributors, but they want to actually know and understand how consumers are consuming the products. So it makes it makes it better for them in terms of what they invest in manufacturing or the back channel. Um, I think that you know it's really how you link the data to productivity in an industry or in a in in, in a segment. And I think where a lot of the work has to has to go now is actually training around you know some of these data scientists and these data companies around you know it's not just enough to present it because the people you are presenting it to yeah fine uh, this information is there but you have to do the work in actually taking that information and showing them how this fundamentally improves their bottom line and i think when people see that you know today they are making investments in marketing um, or some level of promotion fundamentally to drive business once you're able to link that data to how it improves bottom line that's a business model right there. So I think that's, that's probably the evolution that needs to happen. But I think once you can show anybody who is making a profit, how you can use data to increase that profit line, then you have a business model. Great, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. I saw one in the back, yes. Hi everyone, oh, my name is Ali. I'm, uh, I work for Cross Boundary, and we're a transactional advisor. So I just wanted to thank the panelists. I think this discussion has been really insightful. My question is around um, the opportunities that we have on the continent. So we have about nine out of 10 mobile, um, nine out of 10 Africans actually hold a mobile phone. And today we have 300 million um, Africans that are connected on social media. That's like larger than the US market, I think. But when it comes to connectivity and uh, the reliability of connectivity, one is still expensive, and uh, second is not really uh, scalable. So how do you see the connectivity issue um, as it pertains to unlocking the digital opportunity on the continent? I'll, I'll take the question. Uh, yes, uh, when we look at the last 10 years, we can see that there has been a lot of improvement in terms of connectivity in African countries. It has been exponential. I think the issue is not about accessibility, it's what do we do with that access? And uh, like you say, um, social media might not be the most productive way of using that connectivity. So I think the, the challenge should be, yes, around making it more accessible, but also around making it more productive, making people understand that it's a tool that can be used for data science, that can be used for uh, job applications, that can be used for more than just accessing social media. And I think that's where the challenge of Africa is because we have shown that we are able to scale up very quickly. We are able to leapfrog. We are able to deploy infrastructure quickly. But what do we do after we make that accessible to the youth? Uh, are they able to really make the right use of that connectivity? And I think that's where the challenge lies for us. Yeah, I think that um, the reality is that the baseline, uh, the baseline for data collection and connectivity on the continent relies in usage of the internet and smartphone penetration. It's, it's, it's not, you can't avoid it, right? This is the one tool that can reach the billion or whatever. It's the one tool that you can have a one-to-one. -one. It's the one tool that you can deliver information. It's the one tool you can train, develop people. It's the one thing where that can be truly democratized, right? And from my perspective, it's the one place where everything should be channeled towards in terms of future and how we develop the continent and how we think about education and healthcare. This is what we should focus on doing. Now, it's not gonna come without infrastructure development. So if you take Reliance in India as an example, right? Um, 14 years ago, uh, even though it was private sector driven, they made the investment and significantly dropped the cost of data incredibly dropped that cost in, in India. And today you see, you see the impact, right? In terms of today from being at, first of all, they went from being sort of like the fifth largest telco today being the largest telco in, in, in India. And you think of that market size, but the data that they have today has made them basically very quickly move into e-commerce. Um, they're, they're in other sectors. And today it's like one of the two largest, not just telco companies, but companies are across uh, India itself. I think it can't be done without an upfront investment. So if you look at the investment that needs to be made into 5G today, it can't be done without a conscious effort to drop 
But and, and I honestly, my view is that yes, there will be people that will use social media, but we don't need 100% of people being productive. We need one or two percent, right? So it's fine to have 98% of them use it to play around. What you need are two percent of people to actually explosively utilize the access that it gives, and that creates a multiplier effect. So I, I, I just think that it's, 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 it's not a gamble, it's an assurance, and it's the level of um, determination that is required from a government or private sector level to make the investments required to drop that cost and let more people get in. Great. Well, with that, I want to thank uh, fellow panelists. Thank you so much for your time and joining us today, sharing your insights very candidly. Um, but most importantly, thank you for all that you're doing to drive tech on the continent. It's actually incredibly amazing and, and inspiring. So thank you. I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you. <laughs>